right, we're going to uh, continue the Summer Psalms series tonight. Pastor Roger's been doing that all summer, and he had an opportunity to uh, get away with his family for a few days, so we want to uh, hope that he's uh, being refreshed during his time, time away. He'll be back with us uh, for services this coming Sunday, and I, I neglected to mention that next, uh, next Wednesday night, Sam Blosser will be uh, bringing a message to us, so uh, be sure to be here for that. And, uh, but uh, Psalm 86 is where we will we'll go tonight. We'll read the passage first, and then we'll uh, have a word of prayer. Psalm 86, a prayer of David. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have, you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O oh God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seek my life, and they do not set you before them. But you, O oh Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Let's pray. Lord, as we read these words that were written by David so long ago and we look at the troubled world that we are living in today and we see things really haven't changed that much. But we know that you were with David and Lord as your servants here today in the year 2020. I pray that you will be with us. Lord, as David was protected from the evil around him, I pray that you will put a hedge of protection around us. As David proclaimed your word, I pray that we will do the same. And Lord, as we look at this passage this evening, I pray that you will show us what we need to learn and to know from it, that we may take that knowledge and take it out and share with others, help share the, the goodness and the, the love and the mercy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I just pray for our, our time together this evening. I pray that you give us understanding and that you will let us see what, you will, what we need to see. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, well, Psalm 86, uh, as Pastor Roger has, has, has taught us um, this summer, uh, these psalms are not in chrono chronological order. We skipped over Psalm 85. That one was from a time after the Babylonian captivity, about the time of Haggai. We, we, we were, uh, Pastor Roger's uh, working through the book of Haggai there on, there on Sunday. So about Haggai's time was when Psalm 85 would have, would, have, would have occurred. This was a Psalm of David. This one's four or five hundred years older than Psalm 85. And uh, so we can see there that definitely uh, not in chronological order. But it's interesting, we've been going, this, this summer, been going through book three of the Psalms. And even though David wrote at least half of the Psalms that we have in, in, in the Bible, this is the only one with his name on it in all of book three. I mean, we've, we've learned this summer about the sons of Korah and Asaph and the sons of Asaph because they, they had written, you know, everything that we had, uh, 
we studied this summer up so far, but here, this is the only psalm in all of book three that, that uh, is, uh, is David's. So uh, it's interesting that David is one of the, if you're like a, a kid like I was and grew up in, in church and Sundays going to Bible school, David is one of the first Bible characters you learn about. You know, you talk, if you talk to your two or three year olds and ask them what Bible stories they know, they'll tell you uh, Daniel in the lion's den, Noah's ark, and David and Goliath. Those are the three, three of the first stories they know. And they, they can relate to David because in that David and Goliath story, David basically is just a kid. So for, for a kid, that's, that's a good way to get them interested in, in, in the Bible story. But we know that David had tremendous highs in his life and crushing lows. I mean, he had great times and he had deep sorrows. I mean, if you were going to write a fictional story and invent a character like David, no one would believe you because they, you, the reaction would be, that couldn't happen to anyone that way. But we know through the scriptures that that was the life David lived. But we also know that David was a man who trusted and loved the Lord. You know? Now, he wasn't perfect, not even close. Okay? But... He loved God, and he leaned on God, and he confessed his sin to God, and God blessed him. So, in a way, you know, we can relate to that, to that very well, because none of us are, are, are perfect, and we go through highs and lows, and they, just looking around the room, you know, we, uh, just in this room, we've, we've experienced highs and lows just in the last few weeks and months in our, in our own personal lives, okay? And so God is there, just, just like he's, he's uh, been with David. Psalm 86 is filled with petitions. It's technically a lament, but it's also a petition. All right? In these 17 verses, if you, if you, di if you diagrammed it out, in 17 verses there are 15 different petitions from David to the Lord. Almost one per verse. Some verses have more than one, and we'll get into that a little bit later. You know, all of those 15 petitions, though, almost all of them are variants on, on one single idea. It's found uh, most explicitly in verses 3, 6, and 16. In verse 3, it says, Have mercy, be gracious to me, O Lord, for you do I cry all the day. Verse 6 says, Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Hear my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. And then in verse 16 down there, it says, Turn to me. Be gracious for me. Nothing is more important to sinful men and women than finding mercy with God. You know, Charles Spurgeon said that the best of men need mercy and appeal to mercy Nothing but mercy. You know, but naturally, that doesn't come, to, you know, we don't appeal to mercy naturally. You know, we, and be honest, we don't show it to others as often as we should. So, the outline of this psalm is fairly straightforward. Uh, the first seven verses, if you, if you want to break it down, the first seven verses are, are a lament about the, the difficult time that David's going through. Now, we don't know exactly which dark period of David's life this is from. It talks about those who are pursuing him and after him, and that could be any of several different, different time periods in David's life. That could have been when Saul was, was chasing after him, trying to kill him. That could be when he had to flee into the, the land of the Philistines. That could be later in life, you know, when, with the troubles with, with, the, with his son Absalom. You know, the, the, those, those time periods. So we don't know exactly when, when, the, when, this is, uh, uh, when this time period is, but we do know that David is going through a difficult time and that he has enemies that are lined up against him. And uh, he's feeling outnumbered, but he knows that with God, we're not outnumbered. All right? So, like I said, verses 1 through 7 are a lament. Uh, verses 8 to, through 10, we can call that the praise section. Uh, verses 11 to 13 are a, are a prayer. 
And then there's a final petition in verses 14 to 17. But, you know, they're not exclusively that because those, those elements overlap in each of, the, each of the four sections. And so uh, for that reason, it's probably best not to look at it section by section, but by focusing on the most important idea in, this, in the psalm. And, and there are really four in here. The first one is David's relationship with God. Okay? And then the second is David's requests of God. And the third is the reasons David gives that God should answer his requests. And then the last point is the most important characteristic um, of God from the point of the psalmist's need, which we mentioned earlier, that was his God's mercy. All right, so let's, let's, let's look at David's relationship to God first. Um, it's consistent with David's appeal to God's mercy, um, but that becomes explicit first time there in verse 3 that we re they read a minute ago. Um, David does not begin his prayer by telling God that he's deserving or God owes him anything. Okay? Too often, we'll come to God and we'll kind of say, hey, you know, hey God, I've been doing pretty good. You know, I need to, you know, we, 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 we kind of lift ourselves up. But David doesn't do that. He calls himself poor and needy. Now, this was the king of Israel. All right? He... Uh, out of all in the nation there, you know, that seems un unfitting. But David knew that before God, humility was, 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 was how important that was. So he calls himself poor and needy there in, in verse 1. He calls himself the servant of God in verse 2, one looking for God. Uh, uh, to God for help, and then he repeats that later. Later, uh, Verse 7, and uh, then speaks of his troubles there in verse 14, and uh, talk, where he talks about the, the arrogant and, and wicked that are, that are attacking him. And uh, then in verse 16, again, describes himself as, as a servant. Now, let's be honest. I mean, we find it hard to pray that way, don't we? You know, by nature, it's hard to humble ourselves. To be a servant, think about that. that. That doesn't seem worthy, does it? To be a servant? I mean, why would anybody want to be like that? But if you look at it, if you could see us the way God sees us, that we are nothing except what God has made us. You know, we want to be people who call on God and deserve something from God because of who we are. I mean, we're looking around the room. We're we're doing all right. You know, we're we're pretty good people, aren't we? God God should. God should pay attention to us because we're, we're doing just fine. Well, maybe, maybe not just fine, but we're, we're not doing bad. You know, that, that's the attitude of too many, isn't it? We need to understand that we're a speck of dust. God's the creator of the entire universe. Without him, we're nothing. You know, if we could see ourselves from, from the, way, the way God sees us, we would understand that we are poor and needy. We're servants in need of mercy. And David, David realized that. David prayed that way. And God answered David's prayers. I mean, over and over again. You know, David would pray. God would answer. Maybe we don't get the answers from God that we pray for because we're not praying from the right position. Maybe we're, we're trying to lift ourselves up a little bit too much. And I'm pointing at myself on every word I'm saying here. <laughs> of course, we do have, or we have become something of value 
okay, because of God's favor to us. But it's only because of God. And that's the point. All right. The only reason that he's been favorable to us is because he's been merciful to us. Okay. Not because we deserve it, because we don't. I mean, we were born into this world in rebellion to God. And a lot of us lived several years, maybe some decades up into our life in open rebellion to God. Right? We don't deserve anything from him. Okay? I mean, we were, the scripture says that when we were lost, we were enemies of God. But God was merciful to us. God looked, Jesus was on the cross. And you look forward through time and saw this rebel and said, I'm taking his punishment anyway. I didn't deserve that. When David refers to himself as God's servant, he's developing the most important, his most important theme there and, and, and speaking consistently with it. It's only because God's been merciful to him that he has relationship with God and it's only because God has shown him to be merciful that David can even make the appeal. All right? So, as, as we mentioned, David made many requests here. And uh, we, we could take the time to go through them, but we'd be here till 10 o'clock. And uh, we don't want to do that. But as I said, there were 15 petitions in 17 verses. To, to hear, to answer, to have mercy, to bring joy, to listen, to, to save. I mean, they're just over and over, just peppered through, the, through this entire psalm. And most of these petitions have to do with, with perilous circumstance that David's in. And that he, that he talks about right there in the last couple of verses. All right. Now, there, there's, there's hardly a psalm of David that doesn't mention his enemies or ask him for God's help in, uh, in delivering him from their attacks. So it seems like that most of the psalms David wrote come from those dark times of his life. All right? When he realized that he wasn't going to make it on his own. And he had to have God with him or this, you know, things just weren't going to work out. So David, uh, if you read many of, this, of David's psalms throughout, throughout the entire uh, book of psalms, very, very many of them mention dark times and enemies and, and praying to God for deliverance. So uh, this, this, this fits in, fits in one, one with, with, with that just, just, uh, just the way that, uh, that, uh, that it should. Now, in the middle of this uh, uh, request for deliverance, though, there's a, there's a remarkable praise section in verses 11 to 13. Praise that God will teach him his way. And give him an undivided heart. This was the key to David's greatness. He asked God to teach him his way. You know, most of us, when we pray, we're asking for help with circumstances or deliverance with, with, with something we're going through or assistance uh, with, 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 with our life. And uh, we're, we don't seem to be nearly as concerned as to be taught God's way. And uh, in other words, we want the blessings of salvation, but don't always want to, to follow through with the duties. You know, we need to know God's way better every day. You know, we have God's word. You know, I pray that we're, we're in God's word daily to, to help us understand, you know, what, uh, what uh, God's way is. But uh, we want prosperity and personal safety. And uh, while, while we... Uh, Try to do things our own way. I mean, just logically, it doesn't make sense. But David wasn't like this. He knew his own heart. He knew he was prone to wander. And he knew that in God's, it, only in God's way was he going to prosper spiritually. So he asked God for this great blessing. Teach me your way. All right. So... There are four reasons that David um, 
well, let, let, let me back up, back up a second. You know, David buttresses his, his prayers with, with, with sound arguments here. It, you know, they're highlighted in uh, eight of the verses here. There's uh, the word for is, uh, sets them off. It, that, that word for means because. So let's, let's look at these quickly. We just a couple of minutes in. In, in verse one, he says, for I am poor and needy. Okay, so this first reason based on David's plight, you know, he's not mighty or self-sufficient coming before the Lord, even if he is the king, you know, if God's not going to help him, then there's no help to be found. So this, the, David is coming before the Lord and his, his argument that he's making presupposes God's mercy, you know, it's because God is merciful that David knows that he will help those who are poor and needy. Verse 2, the four, four statement is, For I am devoted to you, or, or godly. Right? So the second reason is that the psalmist is in a covenant relationship to God. He's God's servant, and God is his master. So as a servant, he has duties toward God. And uh, this seems to have meant a lot to David at this point in his life. For he calls God Adonai, which uh, were translated Lord there, seven times in this passage. You know, that, that, was, that was a word that, that uh, the Jews of that day used uh, when they were talking about the covenant relationship with God. All right, so, and then in verse, uh, verse 3, he says, For I call to you all the day, all the day long. You know, he's, David's asking God to answer his prayer. You know, God's not obliged to answer the prayers that we offer. But God shows mercy to us and will answer our prayers in, in, in his way. You know, he knows God. He knows God can help. And God is a prayer answering God. We, we, we can all testify to that. So David asked him to take note of the fact that he spends time in prayer. And then the fourth reason there in verse 4 says, For to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. You know, David is calling on God and no other. You know, a pagan may have many gods. And, and David, in that day, Israel was surrounded by nations that had many gods. And uh, back in Israel itself, idolatry was, was a great problem during Old Testament times. You know, when, when, the, when the Israelites came out of Egypt in the Exodus, that 400 years that they spent in Egypt, the sin of idolatry kind of got a hold of them during that time, you know, because the Egyptians were a very idolatrous society. And so when they came out of the Exodus, they hadn't barely crossed the Red Sea, but they, and they made the golden calf. And if you look down through history, the history of Israel from the judges through, through the, the David and Solomon all the way to the end of the nation, all of Old Testament history of Israel, there was problems with idolatry. And the prophets and, and the priests constantly were, were, were teaching the people to, to abhor the idols but they just couldn't eradicate that, that sin from the country. And, and they ended up, the nation ended up going into exile about it. Hold, hold your finger there in, in, in Psalm for just a second. Flip over to Isaiah chapter 44. We'll see what God thinks about all the, the idols that were going on here. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6. Listen, listen to what God, the message of God through Isaiah. Thus said the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. And then flip over one more page to verse, verse 5 of chapter 45, where, where, where that message is repeated. I am the Lord, there is no other. Beside me, there is no God. Now, when we're teaching the Olympian kids over, over in the activity building, we've, we've pretty much got them trained now to answer some, answer some questions correctly. We say, how much does God know? And they'll yell, everything. 
Okay. If there was another God out there, would God know about it? Yeah. God says, I don't know any. You can take it to the bank. There aren't any. Because anything that exists, God would have had to create, and it would be uh, illogical. It would be illogical for God to create another. When all glory and, and honor and worship is, is to be toward him. So back, back to the psalm there. We can see that uh, the idols that were worshipped both around Israel and in Israel really couldn't answer prayer. And David knew that there was one and only God that could hear and answer prayer. And then the last four reasons that... Uh, David uh, gives are based not on David and his need, but on God's character himself. Look in verse 7. The four statement says, for you will answer me. Now, earlier in verse 1, he had asked God to, to hear and answer him. But here, he asserts his confidence that God will actually answer. In other words, he's praying because he knows the prayers of a righteous man are powerful and effective. That's what James tells us in, in, in the New Testament. Prayer is not an empty exercise. Okay. Prayer works. Second of the four reasons on God, based on God's character is in verse 10. It says, for you are great and do wondrous things. God's not only a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. He's a God that's able to do whatever we ask if it's in his will. And he can do greater than what we ask. A lot of times he does. You know, sometimes our prayers aren't big enough. You know, God has a plan for this world. He's going to accomplish his will. We need to be praying to know his will. Because there's a lost world out there. You know, there are over 7 billion people on this planet right now. And every one of them are going to spend eternity somewhere. And uh, we have the key to life right here in this book. And we need to share it with as many of them as we can. We're not going to get them all. But we need to take every opportunity that we, we do have. Because we serve the one and only living God. All right. Uh, in verse 13 is, is the next four statements. It says, for great is your love toward me. So this, this gets closer to the theme of the, the entire passage of God's mercy. It's a plea as a reason for God to answer the prayer based on the fact that his mercy has already been shown on, on the one who's praying. You know. In, in Hebrew, that word that's translated love there is a very powerful word. I don't, I can't, I'm not a Hebrew scholar and I don't know how to pronounce it, but uh, just trust me that uh, that word is, is very powerful and it refers to a covenant type love. All right, love that, that was promised in, in a covenant relationship. So God established a covenant like this with David. And the, uh, the closest analogy that we, we have is... Um, the fact that we, as Christians today in the, in the age of grace, we've been adopted into God's family. Okay, so we're, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're sons and daughters of God. So we have that, that, that love, that family love. So that, that, that's, the, that's the closest analogy of what David would be, would be talking about there. You know, it, it's a great, strong love that, that, uh, that, that God was showing to him. And then the last of, of, of the four statements is there in, in, in verse 17. It says, For you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. David's saying, God, you have answered my prayers in the past. And I'm trusting that you will answer again. Oh, it's, uh, it's consistent with David's experience with God to ask for mercy. So, in, in summary, since uh, we're, we're almost out of time, you know, we are, here, here we have one of, one of the great 
Old Testament characters. But he realized who he was and who God is. You know, that's something some of us still have trouble with. It doesn't always sink in exactly, you know, where we stand in position to God, you know. You know, we believe that God should do what we want him to do. And we ask, ask him for certain things. We, we almost treat him like a, like, a, like, a, like a vending machine or an ATM. We go, go to him and we, we hit a button when we need something and, and, and respect, you know, expect to get out of him exactly what we want. But God's not like that. You know, God is the infinite creator of the universe. And that, it's that infinite part that, that we'll never be able to understand. You know, people say that God is love. Yes, he is. It's, as an infinite God, it is impossible to love more than he does. God's righteous. As an infinite God, it's impossible to be more righteous. God is merciful. As an infinite God, it's impossible to be more merciful than God is. Right? And, and, and on and on. So, in light of that, David's prayer is a good, good, good template for us to use. God, I am poor and needy. Hear my prayer. Deliver me from the circumstances that I'm in. Let's pray.